Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. My name is Sean Vitke. I'm director of the Fourth Amendment Advisory Committee. I am going to make this really brief, uh, but it's my humbling honor to introduce founding members of the Fourth Amendment Caucus. And we'll start with Representative Amash. So uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I first want to uh, give my thoughts to Ted Poe. Um, he announced that he's being treated for leukemia. So he's in our thoughts and prayers. He's one of the uh, co-chairs of this caucus. He's been a great defender of the Fourth Amendment, a great friend. And so um, uh, we pray for him and his family and, um, and uh, pray that, they, that he heals. So I want to um, thank Zoe Lofgren, uh, my colleague. I want to thank uh, Ted Poe. I want to thank all of the members of the Fourth Amendment Caucus. It's uh, critical at this time that we have a caucus like this to defend our rights. Uh, we've seen attacks on the Fourth Amendment over the past uh, two decades, frankly, like nothing we've seen before. And I think we're at a time in history where uh, our protections are not even uh, being secured by the Supreme Court the way that we'd hope they would be. So it's important that we have uh, this kind of group in, in Congress to stop things before they become law and before they have a chance to uh, violate the rights of Americans. And um, it's an honor to be working with this group. We've worked as a group, even though we didn't have a formal caucus, for many years now. And um, uh, we couldn't have uh, a better uh, chairman of this group than Zoe Lofgren. And um, I've been uh, blessed to work with her. And I'm, I'm glad that this is a bipartisan group because this is not a Republican or Democrat issue. This is an issue for all Americans. And um, I'm just honored to be a part of it. Uh, just this past week, we were able to push back on um, some expansions uh, of Fourth Amendment violations, particularly an expansion of the Patriot Act. And I think as a caucus, those are the kind of things we need to be able to alert other members about. And by having this group here, um, we, can, we can take charge and take action uh, before something gets to the floor. So I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Zoe Lofgren and Ted Poe for, for putting this together and um, glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin. I uh, want to give Ted, uh, Ted Poe uh, credit because although we've all worked together, as Justin has said, on Fourth Amendment issues, it was Ted's idea to actually have a Fourth Amendment caucus and that he and I would co-chair. And I think, as Justin said, it's very important. You know, the uh, Fourth Amendment is fundamental to our liberty, not just because it protects privacy rights, but because it's the basis for exercising other rights. Uh, if you feel that you are being watched at all times by your government, you're not going to feel as free to exercise your First Amendment rights of speech or uh, assembly. And so it is important uh, that the Congress step forward. We're so used to the court being the arbiter of what the Constitution says, and obviously they play a key role. But the Congress also has a role to play on that. And I think in many uh, cases, we have failed to exercise that jurisdiction, especially in the digital age. You know, the digital age has allowed us as uh, Americans, as citizens of the world, to do unprecedented things. It's also allowed the government to do unprecedented things in following us. And I think one of the things we need to do uh, is to evaluate the old uh, assumptions uh, about the Fourth Amendment, the legal assumptions, and whether they still work. If you take a look at Smith v. Maryland, it's kind of a slim read uh, to, to take a look at how all of our privacy uh, is, is related to that, and it doesn't work uh, in a digital age. You know, it may be one thing to think I'm in plain view. I walk out my front door in my bathrobe to pick up my newspaper, and I know the people across the street can see me. That's very different than having a camera at every red light in every store, having the ability to uh, accumulate all of the uh, 
video data, to data mine it, and to basically say where every American is at every moment. That's a different type of plain view than the doctrine envisioned. Third party records, no expectation of privacy. Maybe that made sense with paper records. Does it make the same sense for your browser history, which may actually be more revealing than an email? I think not. So we have a lot of work to do, and as Justin said, it's going to be a bipartisan effort. You know, we fight a lot on things we disagree on, uh, and, and that's fine, we can argue about that. But it's a pleasure to be able to work with my friends across the aisle on something we do agree on. And one of the things that has been my principle is if you disagree with someone on eight things, it shouldn't prevent you from working on the, on the remaining two where you do agree and it's important for our country. So I think this is going to be, this is a kickoff. It's going to be an important effort. It's not just a kickoff, it's every day, all of the um, uh, legislation that we uh, envision. And I think with our co-sponsorship and our leadership of members, I see Tulsi here and Ted Lu and others, we will have perhaps additional clout to clarify these issues for members. When we vote um, on matters, sometimes it's very quick. There are amendments, there's not time to uh, thoroughly uh, study these things, and so members are looking to others who who've taken the time to actually do the research. I see this group as being part of that. And obviously there are members of Congress who are sincere, but have a very different view of what the Fourth Amendment should be and the privacy rights of Americans. So uh, we're, we're in a battle of ideas with those individuals and hopefully uh, our Constitution and the Fourth Amendment will win for Americans. So with that, I will stop, and we have a great panel here today. I don't know whether uh, Ted and Tulsi want to say something briefly, but uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I will be very brief. Uh, Zoe, very well said. I, I want to thank the leadership of Zoe Lofgren and Ted Poe, who um, is in all of our prayers uh, today, as well as uh, Justin Amash and, and my colleague Ted Liu. I'm really proud to be a part of this bipartisan caucus for all the reasons that Zoe and Justin spoke about. This is an issue that uh, defies partisanship. Uh, some of the votes that we've taken on some key issues just in the time that I've been in Congress uh, have been unpredictable votes, largely because as members have become more educated and informed, about the implications of some of these bills or amendments that we take votes on, on our Fourth Amendment, on our privacy and civil liberties, and thinking more deeply about some of the arguments that are made oftentimes invoking fear in people in the name of security uh, in a way that deeply violates our, our constitutional Fourth Amendment rights. Um, many of these votes have been very close and many of the outcomes have been unpredictable. Uh, which shows both the need for this caucus, but also the opportunity that we have uh, to be able to continue to bring voice to these issues, to bring voice to these concerns, and make sure that we're um, exercising our responsibility as members of Congress to walk that balancing line between ensuring safety and security of the American people while also preserving and protecting uh, our constitutional uh, rights and, and civil liberties. So. Uh, I look forward to being able to continue to be a part of this dynamic uh, group as we tackle the many challenges that exist and make sure that we are on the forefront of protecting uh, our Constitution. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Ted Liu. It's an honor to be here and want to uh, thank uh, Zoe Lofgren and Ted Poe for co-chairing this caucus and uh, Justin and Tulsi uh, as founding members. I just want to say uh, that when members of Congress take an oath of office, when the president does, when members of the military do, we don't take an oath to a political party or any particular administration or even to the U.S. government. We take an oath to the Constitution, and that's pretty profound. And what that means is if there is a federal program that we know will save lives, we cannot execute it if it violates the Constitution. 
And one of the reasons we have this caucus here is to push back and make sure that all of us adhere to the first principle, which is we have to follow the Constitution of the United States. It's an oath we took. Uh, it's what uh, has made this country great. And I look forward to working with all of you uh, to continue doing that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much to the representatives. So again, uh, my name is Sean Vitka. I'm the director of the Fourth Amendment Advisory Committee. Um, quick note, uh, we have a press release outside. It's got the list of the 25 members of Congress who have joined this caucus for its launch. Uh, I think that's a pretty incredible cast. It's also amazingly bipartisan. It's 13 Republicans, 12 Democrats, um, by my last count. And I'm sure it'll grow and stay bipartisan in nature. Um, I, I, we're, we're not just here to recognize the, the leadership, though, of these people, and I, I really strongly want to commend uh, their work, uh, Representatives Poe, Representative Lofgren, um, and everybody in the caucus has proven to be an amazing leader and a very necessary leader. But the reason why the Fourth Amendment Caucus is so important um, isn't just because they're good leaders. The reason that the Fourth Amendment Caucus is important is because there are a wealth of challenges that we face today that we have faced and that we will face tomorrow. So with that in mind, we decided to set up a panel to help discuss these issues and flesh them out. A lot of them are issues that you may have heard about. There are a lot of them are issues that have confronted Congress already, but a lot of them are issues that you probably haven't heard about. And those are some of the ones that I'm most excited to get to. Um, so in the nature of, or in the interest of a brief introduction, um, I'm joined by this wonderful panel of people who's joined me here. Um, Mike Godwin uh, on the far side with the R Street Institute. We also have Alvaro Bedoya, who is the Executive Director of the Center of Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law. And then, as always, we have Nima Singuliani, who is the Legislative Counsel with the ACLU Washington office. There's a lot to talk about, but context is extremely important. I wanted to toss it to Mike first, um, especially given the remarks that we just heard about how the Fourth Amendment has changed over time. Representative Lofgren hit the nail on the head, as she often does, by talking about how it just doesn't quite mean the same thing that it used to. And when you apply the old things uh, in a new way, it doesn't always come to the right answer. Sure. You know, I, I, when I was thinking about my remarks for today's panel, I, 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 for some reason, uh, perversely, how could I make this the most boring panel possible. I said, well, I could just like read the language of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, so I am going to read that, but, uh, but, but let me wait. I'm going to wait and see if I can sort of lure you into it a, a little bit, uh, so we'll have a little bit of a setup. Uh, a couple hundred years ago, it was, uh, privacy was the default. You know, government, privacy from government was just the way things were. If you wanted to have a private conversation, you walked down the road. If you didn't want people to see into your house, you closed the door, you closed the window. Uh, if you, you know, basically, if you didn't want to be overheard, you would walk down the road with your friend to have a private conversation. And, and, and it, it was not obvious that anybody could snoop on you or capture information about what you had said or what you had done. Uh, and then, uh, even so, uh, 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 more than 200 years ago, uh, 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 the colonists in the United States, the framers of the Constitution, uh, recognized that there were, uh, that, that governments sometimes feel the temptation for, sometimes for the best reasons, to go through everything you have. <laughs> you know, to take everything you have and look through it. Uh, to, uh, 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 to snoop on you, to find out things about you, uh, to gather evidence about you, and so, as I said, sometimes for good reasons, but that there ought to be, there ought to be limits. Uh, and so the question uh, that uh, confronted uh, the framers of the Constitution, and in particular, I want to uh, underscore the role of John Adams, uh, later president, who, who wrote the f uh, 14th Amendment of the Massachusetts uh, State Constitution that later, that really, I think, informed uh, the construction of the Fourth Amendment in the U.S. Uh, Constitution. Um, but so here's the part where I read the text. I'm sorry, this is going to be really fast. Um, uh, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the things and the persons or things to be seized. Now, this is obviously a run-on sentence. This could have used. I mean, you really could have done this a little bit better in terms of headline writing. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it, it does cover a lot of ground, and, and one of the things that I notice when we talk about 
uh, Fourth Amendment in the digital age is we talk about search warrants a lot and the scope of warrants and what's probable cause. That's all in the second part. That's all in the second part of the Fourth Amendment. That stuff is hugely important, but obviously the Fourth Amendment limits searches in a lot of situations in which no warrants are issued at all, like when a policeman stops to ask you what you're doing. Uh, or There are all sorts of different uh, quest questions that are Fourth Amendment questions that don't have to do with the warrant requirement or probable cause or any of that stuff. The first part is about unreasonable searches and seizures. And this is the thing that I think that has really, really changed fundamentally uh, in, in the modern era. And, and uh, as Representative uh, Lofgren uh, commented, uh, you know, the precedents haven't always gone the right way. She mentioned Smith versus Maryland. Those of you who are uh, Fourth Amendment hobbyists, and I know many of you are, uh, know that that's a case talking about telephone records uh, and how that didn't really implicate privacy interests or Fourth Amendment interests. We also know that for a long time in the history of this country, wiretaps themselves were not considered to raise Fourth Amendment interests. From 1928, you know, essentially for 40 years, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, it was a matter of constitutional law that wiretapping did not implicate the Fourth Amendment. There was, it, it was not a person, a place, or a thing to be searched or seized. So therefore, reasoned the Olmstead Court in 1928, it's, it, it's not covered. Well, we've evolved a little since then, and we recognize that uh, uh, if the Constitution and our, our privacy interests is protected under the Fourth Amendment or to mean anything, we have to uh, proactively protect them, first in the age of uh, telephony, when, we, when Congress proactively put a framework in place uh, uh, to, limit, uh, uh, to limit wiretapping and to put limits on the kinds of things that people can do when they intercept communications. Uh, but, but certainly in the digital age, the fact is each of us, you know, each of us is carrying probably multiple devices. And anyone who has access to any one of those devices or any of the accounts associated with any of those devices can probably learn a whole lot about us, about any of us. Uh, and the question is, what is reasonable in that context? How do you create limits under the law on what government can do that we would call reasonable in an era in which we carry our whole lives around? on these devices or on this one. You know, how do we change, how do we, how do we proactively do that? Congress has done that before, uh, and, Congress, uh, and Congress continues to proactively protect uh, the Bill of Rights. Uh, I, I always like to mention in this context that Congress has proactively protected other amendments too, like the First Amendment, but notably in this context, uh, the Privacy Protection Act of 1980, in case you're wondering what I'm alluding to. But uh, in, in the Fourth Amendment context, we have to think very hard about um, what it means to turn our devices, these intimate digital things that record our lives, that we carry with us, into uh, a, a, a grab bag for, any, for government for any purpose. And if there are limits on what government can do, what should those limits be? That, that is the heart of this discussion, and I'm so excited to be here for the launching announcement of this caucus. Thank you, Mike. On, I think one of the most important things that, that Mike talked about here, and I, I think he generally talks about it, is practiceness. The, the notion of the Fourth Amendment being a floor, not a ceiling, to what Congress can do to guarantee privacy is a really important aspect that, in today's day and age, a lot of people have lost track of. On that note, I wanted to invite Alvaro and Nima, um, whichever order that you prefer, to discuss an issue that either is in front of Congress or not yet in front of Congress that Congress is going to have to confront that is something that we can deal with as an emergency, we can deal with it like the Patriot Act, or we can be proactive. So let's talk about that powerful, sorry, that powerful scene that Representative Lofgren left us with of cameras watching our every move. Um, and a lot of people talk about geolocation tracking, and we should. A lot of people talk about stingrays, and we should. Drones, we should. People are not talking about face recognition technology enough. And I want to give you three scenarios um, that I want you to think about. And for each scenario, think, am I comfortable with that? Or perhaps more importantly, is my boss comfortable with that? First scenario, um, there's a street. There's a violent crime, really violent crime. It's a murder. It's a shooting. Um, and not just one person, several people. There is a security camera that captures the, the face of the person. And the police take that camera still and run it against a database of mugshots 
of people arrested in that state. And they use face recognition technology to find the suspect. Are you comfortable with that? Um, let's change the scenario a little bit. Same street, there's not a violent crime, there's a petty crime. Could be graffiti. Or it could be the kinds of petty crimes that occur every single time there's a Tea Party rally or a Black Lives Matter rally. Um, blocking the entrance to a building, obstructing traffic, disorderly conduct. And the police take the image of the people's faces from that same security camera, and they don't run it against mug shots. They run it against every single driver's license photo of every driver in that state. They do this without a warrant or any kind of court supervision. They do this without any kind of audits for misuse or accuracy. And the little we do know about accuracy suggests that face recognition technology misidentifies people ages 18 to 30, women, and African Americans at higher rates than other people. Are you comfortable with that world? Any crime, driver's license databases. Third scenario, in some of the most advanced cities with the most advanced police forces, the police say, enough of this retroactive stuff. You know, I want to find where this person is right now. And so they go up on that security camera with real-time face recognition technology. So every single face that passes by in front of that camera, this technology is asking, is this my person? Is this my guy? Is this my guy? Is this my guy? Every face is being scanned. Again, no warrants, no court supervision, no audits, no accuracy guarantees. Are you comfortable with that world? What I have just described is not, are not hypotheticals. This is reality, okay? We have made a conservative estimate, uh, and my colleague Claire Garvey is leading this study for us, um, that at least one out of every five jurisdictions in, in the country are using face recognition technology. It's likely much higher than that. I can also tell you that one out of every three drivers in the country is part of an FBI face recognition network that has been searched 36 thousand times in four and a half years without warrants, without court supervision, without accuracy audits, without misuse audits. And um, I want to leave you with, uh, uh, well, and the other thing to keep in mind is while states are starting to legislate on drones and say, use them for this, don't use them for this, people are starting to legislate on uh, geolocation technology. Utah has a powerful geolocation law. Uh, you got to get a warrant. You can't do it on anything. Um, there are zero state or federal laws reigning in face recognition technology. So two thoughts on this. The first is the Supreme Court has come close. It's come right up to the lip of saying you have a right to privacy in public, but it has yet to actually say that. But that is not a limit on you because over and over the Wiretap Act, the uh, Stored Communications Act, which used to be a good law and now it's out of date, uh, um, and several other laws, uh, uh, are places where Congress has said, Supreme Court says this is the floor of the Fourth Amendment, we're going to protect more than that. So you are in a position to fix this, okay? That's the first thought. The second thought I want to leave you with is that the FBI's own face recognition database that has about 30 million photos, 25 million mugshots, 5 million non-criminal photos, they are right now, literally right now, in the process of trying to strip that database of critical protections under the Privacy Act that would make it much harder for you to figure out whether you're in the database, make it much harder to figure out if there are inaccuracies in that database, and make it impossible for private citizens to sue the FBI for abusing that database. Okay, that's happening right now at the Department of Justice, a rulemaking procedure, and I think all of our organizations uh, have signed letters, filed comments uh, opposing this. Um, the very last thing I'll say is, let's say you go back to your boss and say, hey boss, we need to work on face recognition, law enforcement face recognition. Um, a lot of the folks, a lot of your bosses are going to say, all right, um, but what about Dallas? What about Orlando? Um, you know, what if we had, what if we hadn't caught those guys? What if we just had a security camera footage? Don't you want to use this technology to get after folks uh, for those serious crimes? And I would submit to you, I personally, I don't want to represent the views of other folks, is that you can say, yes, but we want the serious technology to be used on serious crimes. We want it to be used with warrants or other forms of court supervision for certain other kinds of face recognition, and we want it to be used with audits and oversight. And so being uh, 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 wanting to catch dangerous people is not, uh, 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 what, what's the opposite of synonymous? Antonymous? 
uh, uh, with uh, privacy and civil liberties. So um, uh, I'd love to talk about that and other things, and thank you so much for this and having me. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, Nima, I'll give you this. I think it might be easier. Oh. Um, and yeah, no, sorry, thank you. <laughs> Um, well, first, thanks um, for this panel and uh, this caucus. I'm, I'm really excited that there are members on both sides of the aisle um, that are really interested in delving into a lot of these issues. Um, I wanted to sort of talk about two issues that are emerging that I think um, it would be really important for Congress to have oversight of and to focus on. Um, and the first involves surveillance that's occurring outside U.S. borders. Um, a lot of you might have been here last year when there was a major um, debate over the Patriot Act and Section 215, which is you know the program the government had used to to collect the call records um, of every person in the U.S. And I think that you know a lot of the offices who worked on that legislation saw it as a step forward, saw it as you know a lot of members really expressing very legitimate concerns about surveillance, you know, blowing up for national security purposes and being conducted in a way um, that wasn't consistent with the Fourth Amendment. Um, but what I don't think that many offices realize is that authority is only the tiniest sliver of what the government is able to do and what the government is doing in terms of the surveillance they collect. Um, the most used authority for surveillance is Executive Order 12333. Um, and what that governs is surveillance that's occurring outside U.S. borders. It's surveillance that happens without any approval from the FISA court. Um, there's been, you know, to my knowledge in the last few years, no public hearings on focused on 12333. Um, Senator Feinstein has said that there's been inadequate supervision of 12333. Um, so, you know, to just provide some context as to what this means, you know, if I send an email to my aunt in India and that email is stored in the U.S., there is a process that the government would have to go through to get that email. You know, depending on the scenario, they may have to get approval from the FISA court. There may be certain minimization procedures that are required under the law. Um, there are a variety of protections, um, may not be adequate from my um, perspective, but there are protections that exist. If that same email is sitting on a server in, let's say, Europe, somewhere in Europe, in India, in a variety of other countries, anywhere outside the U.S., the government can get that without following any of those procedures. It is purely based on a determination by the executive branch and procedures that the intelligence agencies create on their own and which, frankly, we have very little knowledge and insight into. And what I think that that really highlights is a need for us to bring our surveillance laws, um, you know, to make them consistent with the way technology actually works. I think if you looked at 20 or 30 years ago, you know, the assumption that something that you collected outside the U.S. would have less, you know, implications for Americans in the U.S., that might have been a fair assumption. It's not a fair assumption today. And it's not a fair assumption today because many of the major technology companies that we all rely on and that we all use, you know, have data storage centers around the world. And so if we ignore this whole bucket of surveillance that is happening under 12333, you're ignoring the vast majority of foreign intelligence collection that happens. Um, and so what can we do? Right now, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board has said that they are examining certain facets of 12333 collection. We don't have that report. Um, but I think in the near term, there are two things. One is, I think that there are a lot of um, questions that still remain unanswered about 12333. Basic data. You know, how many Americans have had their information collected under 12333? How many Americans have had their information stored? How often is that database being searched? You know, what are the procedures if information gathered under 12333 are used as part of a, a criminal investigation or a criminal prosecution? And so I think having members start to ask those questions both formally and in hearings is really important. Um, and the second thing I would say is, you know, next year we're going to have a debate over various authorities um, under FISA, Section 702 specifically. Um, I think it's time for that debate and that conversation to include, you know, how do we bring surveillance that's happening under 12333, how do we bring it under a fr the framework that exists for other surveillance? You know, it seems there's a level of absurdity to attach to the fact that, you know, an email simply by virtue of what data center is stored in is going to have a different level of protection. To the average American, that doesn't matter. That email is the same level of sensitivity, and for them, it's the same importance. And our law should reflect that. So I think that that's one area. Um, where 
there has been very little work to date, but it is you know, probably the most important area in terms of surveillance reform that our, our country needs to address. Um, the second issue um, is that we are now seeing a lot of importation of technologies that were designed for military use into local communities. And not all communities are affected equally. Um, and this, I think, very much connects to the, the nationwide debate we're having about disparate impact, about policing, about militarization. Um, here's, you know, an, a good example is a stingray. Um, some of you might have heard this, but essentially this is a device that simulates um, a cell tower. So if I want to make a phone call, instead of connecting to my AT&T or my Verizon tower, I would connect to this device. Once I connect to that device, law enforcement can get information about my location, about the serial number of my phone. Often, stingrays operate by jamming devices. And so my phone might be jammed from connecting to an AT&T service. So there have been reports in the past that, for example, if people wanted to make 911 calls or call their therapist, that those calls weren't able to go through because law enforcement was using stingrays in those areas. That has enormous implications for communities. It has implications for businesses who maybe rely on phones um, and you know, connect, being able to connect with others for their day-to-day -day business. It has implications for you know, somebody who happens to live next to the target of one of these devices because everybody's information is collected, everybody's phones in the area are collected. Um, and you know, I raise that example because I think it's a really good, um, really good example of how we don't have any idea about whether there's disparate impact on the use of those devices. We don't have a sense of whether certain communities are constantly having interrupted cell service or constantly having their information collected simply by virtue of, you know, whether it's bias or whether it's simply, you know, policing patterns or whether it may be even, you know, legitimate um, differences in how the device is deployed, but has larger implications on communities as a whole. And so I think that we need to start talking about, number one, when the devices are, when new surveillance technologies are deployed into communities, how do we start measuring that impact? And how does, when federal dollars are going to communities, what should attach, um, attach to those dollars in terms of transparency and in terms of monitoring? You know, I tend to happen to think that it's a bit crazy that if the federal government wants to use a stingray, they have a policy. But if they give money to a state government to use the same device, they don't have to abide by that policy. That doesn't seem consistent with me with, with good governance. Um, and I think the second thing we have to start thinking about is, you know, perhaps before technology is deployed, not after, there should be a conversations happening with communities about the effect of those devices and whether they should be deployed at all. There are some states that have said, you know what, we don't want to use stingrays. We recognize that they, you know, in some cases they may help law enforcement, but we don't think that they're a good thing. And I think that those conversations need to happen before devices are deployed, not only so the right policies can be developed, but so that we can decide, hey, perhaps these are things that were designed for military use, they've served their purpose, and they're not things that should be used for general policing of, of low-level crimes. Um, so those are two things that I, you know, I'd urge you to, to think about if you're talking to your boss and they're, you know, they want to say, what are issues I can work on, and you know, happy to chat about any of them more. Thank you, and uh, you can see why I'm such a fan of these people. Um, there is a, a thread that I think connects all, everything that, that you all just said. Um, and bef before I get to that, actually, I, I should say, uh, for the, the staff members in the room, I want to say thank you, um, actually, in particular, to the staff members who helped make the caucus, or made the caucus happen, really. Um, but also for those of you who are interested in this issue, trying to take a deep dive into it. It's incredibly complex. There are a million ways it can apply. That's one of the reasons we're trying to provide this survey of, of things. One of the approaches that is often a mistake, in my opinion, from Congress is the concept of more surveillance or less surveillance. It's so much more complicated than that. The, the point that Mike brought up about reasonableness, the fact that we don't really talk about reasonableness, um, the idea that phone calls were once upon a time not considered protected under the Fourth Amendment um, shows how important proactive, proactive uh, action from Congress is. Um, on that note, and Mike, you, you may want to comment on a variety of the other things that have been said, but I think the reasonableness conversation ties really well, uh, ties well into the, um, something that, that Nima brought up about 215, about the uh, debate that we had last year. Firstly, 215 didn't stop any attacks. 
correct? I mean, that's as far as anybody knows from the outside. There are no known attacks that have stopped. There's only one case that 215 metadata, I should say the telephone metadata dragnet, has been tied to, and it's a case called Basali Moalan, and it's, uh, I'm not saying Basali Moalan is a good guy, but it's worth looking into it. It's about somebody sending money to Somalia who was a tax driver in San Diego. It's not exactly the homegrown terror plot that we were scared with when the conversation about 215 expiration was being uh, debated in Congress. Um, so I just wanted to add that commentary. But, but Mike, I do want to go back to you. So the, the reasonableness of uh, uh, the reasonableness component of the Fourth Amendment over time, one of the most interesting ways that, that can be applied now is in the context of encryption. That's also something that I'm sure is extremely interesting to the people in this audience. It's something that is in front of Congress that, as I, I think it's fair to say, nobody's quite sure yet what to do about it in Congress. Um, and I'd really love for you to just kind of explain your take on encryption. Uh, and how, and, and 30 seconds, right? Um, so, in a nutshell, all of you know that we have digital technologies that allow us to keep stuff pretty secret. That's well established. Um, when uh, uh, Representative Poe hosted a, a, a field hearing uh, that I attended uh, in Houston, uh, we, the, it was titled the Fourth Amendment uh, in, in cyberspace, I think. But what it was deep. But, but of course, we were all talking about Apple iPhone encryption a lot. And, and, and technically, in that case, it wasn't a Fourth Amendment case. It was a, a, it was a different kind of case uh, under the Constitution because the phone belonged to an employer and was not, you know, it didn't belong to a, a living person and so on. Um, but encryption turns out to be hugely important because it actually implicates more than one amendment in our Bill of Rights. Uh, we know it's well established in our constitutional law that our ability to speak freely sometimes depends on our ability to speak privately. It sometimes depends even on our ability uh, to speak anonymously. Uh, we need to be able to do these things. This part of public life is the idea that you do get to speak privately and anonymously from time to time. Uh, there was a lot of anxiety, uh, you know, I've been doing internet law now for 25 years, but there was a lot of anxiety in the early days of the public internet about the anonymity of the internet, and I always had to laugh because it was like the least anonymous thing I could think of. Um, uh, it turns out to be relatively, you have to make some efforts to cover your tracks on the internet. But we do enable people, uh, even now, to uh, especially people, uh, people who are activists, dissidents in other countries, uh, people who are politically active, people who want to who want to attend a, an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and maybe just you know want to be anonymous uh, online and do that. We have anonymity uh, interests uh, that, that need to be protected, and we use encryption as one of the tools to make sure that these things happen. Um, the, 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 that's, so that's First Amendment interest, but there's also Fifth Amendment interests about compelled uh, uh, self-incrimination. Uh, and as, uh, uh, as Judge Poe and I w w had a chance to discuss in Houston at the field hearing, there's even a Thirteenth Amendment aspect of uh, encryption, which is uh, compelled. Uh, there's no involuntary servitude under the Constitution, thanks to the Civil War. Uh, so compelling, some, compelling Apple to write code uh, you know, to, to meet some specification is an interesting 13th Amendment issue. So, so encryption turns out to uh, implicate a whole bunch of stuff, uh, uh, not just privacy, but our Fourth Amendment, but also our First Amendment. It, uh, it also has even a self-protection element for those Second Amendment fans in the room. But, but we, and, and quartering of soldiers, that's the Third Amendment. You don't want to have soldiers quartered in your phone company. So all of these things are implicated, I think, by the... <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. See, this is, this is what happens if you're a constitutional lawyer too long. Uh, you get to do this stuff. Uh, you like that Third Amendment? The Third Amendment is still alive. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we know that uh, uh, privacy, the ability to speak, the ability to keep secrets, the ability to be anonymous, these are all enabled by uh, uh, cryptographic technologies. Uh, and we need to preserve the right to use those tools, and we need to uh, uh, limit the, the, the government's efforts to generally limit our constitutional rights to use those tools. Yeah, um, if I could just add one, one theme. If you talk about encryption, you have to talk about Martin Luther King. And um, if you think about the right to privacy, um, whatever you think about Edward Snowden, I don't think you should think about Edward Snowden. 
I think you should think about Martin Luther King. Um, if there is a single most salient victim of abusive government surveillance in our history, it is without question Martin Luther King. Um, he was wiretapped and bugged and followed by the FBI. He was wiretapped not just by the FBI, but also by the NSA. Uh, uh, and the important thing to realize, and why am I talking about this in the context of encryption, is that at the time, this was legal. Okay, this wasn't something that J. Edgar Hoover was like, Psst, I think you should wiretap Martin Luther King, and then they go, went and wiretapped him. Um, this went up the ranks in the FBI, and there was a wiretap approval request sent to RFK, sent to Robert F. Kennedy, that Robert F. Kennedy signed off on repeatedly. Uh, and that the president at the time, John F. Kennedy, knew of and acquiesced to. And so, um, importantly, even when surveillance is legal, doesn't mean that it is right. And one can only, oh, and importantly, um, the, the quote unquote fruits of that surveillance of Martin Luther King were prepared in a uh, letter and a recording that eventually uh, was opened by Coretta Scott King uh, about two months after Martin Luther King got the Nobel Peace Prize. And it contained excerpts from um, alleged intimate encounters, that Martin Luther, extramarital encounters that Martin Luther King had had in hotel rooms. Um, and uh, Martin Luther King thought, and a lot of people think when they read the letter, that it was telling him he should commit suicide uh, before accepting the Nobel Peace Prize. There was, it basically got caught up in his offices, um, and then it was routed to the home of Coretta Scott King and Martin Luther King. And so um, encryption isn't just about uh, uh, bad guys are going to hide their bad stuff. It, it lets good guys do good things when government disagrees with them. And so I'd encourage all of you to look at, look at encryption in that light. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, all of these points I agree with. I just sort of want to talk about two separate things to think about with encryption. I may think one, when there's been a lot of proposals, you know, that have been bouncing around about how to deal with encryption. Some have talked about mandatory kind of backdoors where, where developers would make sure that they would always have access to communications. Others have been talking about ways that, you know, perhaps companies could be compelled um, to develop new software to allow law enforcement to, to hack into a phone that came up with the most recent Apple case. But I think what all of this speaks to sort of separately is the extension of kind of a dangerous idea. And that's that the private sector should be responsible for helping the government build its surveillance architecture. And, you know, to think about, just to pull back and to think about that, you know, this is a situation where you have many companies saying, if we do what you ask us to do, it will be bad for our customers. It will be bad for privacy and First Amendment reasons. It will be bad for security reasons. There might be unanticipated costs or liability because there are now vulnerabilities that are built into our products and we can't ensure that that's, those vulnerabilities are not exploited by other bad actors. And the idea that the government should be forcing private companies to change their products in a way that you know, is not good for their customers and not consistent with the products they want to deliver, I think in this context is an extension of, of a dangerous idea. And then the second thing that I think it's really important to think about when you're thinking about proposals around encryption or proposals that would ensure that um, law enforcement has access to encrypted devices is how that would work given existing legal doctrines that haven't yet adjusted to the modern world. Um, Representative Lofgren talked about the plain view doctrine, for example. Courts have interpreted that doctrine to mean, let's say police pick up a cell phone, right? And they want to, they get the cell phone because they want to say, look, I'm looking for a text message on July 12th that demonstrates that this person, you know, may have committed X crime. Under the plain view doctrine, many agencies have said, well, that means I can search through everything on that cell phone. That means emails, other photos, other text messages, you know, potentially that could even um, reach, um, you know, things that the cell phone connects to in applications. You know, the idea that simply because law enforcement has access to one slice of um, what is stored on your cell phone should give them access to everything under the plain view doctrine, I think a lot of people would find concerning. And so I also think that, you know, as these proposals are sort of, you know, being floated to think about, you know, not just what law enforcement is requesting access to or what they, what the purpose of an investigation is, but how all of these other kind of aged legal doctrines could be applied um, and could really affect um, all, of these, um, all of these rights and all of these values that are very important 
um, to, to protesters, to everyday people as they sort of go about their lives. I want to uh, pose uh, open, open commentary here. Uh, I know Mike and I have spoken about it before. The, the question of uh, encryption, is it guaranteed by the Fourth Amendment or does it guarantee the Fourth Amendment? Well, I, so I have no mind here, Mike, but I'm sorry. Really <laughs> sorry, um, I didn't stop that. It's, it's all right. It's all right. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so look. I, Encryption, cryptography, the word breaks down into writing and code. It's writing, it's secret writing. That's what the word means. Um, so uh, it means, it can be understood to mean private writing. It, uh, it, it is something that uh, implicates the Fourth Amendment clearly. Uh, we also have court rulings that say that uh, uh, writing cryptographically and developing cryptographic tools are, are protected by the First Amendment as well. That, that, ca that case law is on the books. Uh, it's out there, uh, and and uh, so so if you're asking, is it? I, I think we don't want to mush it together. We think that these, uh, we think that the tools uh, uh, are not quite uh, the same as the Constitution. We we imagine that the tools will continue to evolve, and our Constitution evolves in different ways, uh, in in more formal ways. Um, but I I think that uh, if I understand where you're going uh, uh, with this question. Um, I think that you don't want to just say, for example, that police cannot use encryption or governments cannot use cryptanalytic methods to f try to figure stuff out. We all, every one of us has watched at least one episode of some show with CSI in the title. Um, every one of us in here, I feel certain, has done that. Um, and, um, and we don't want to say, Oh, oh, police, we're going to stop technology in 2016, and you're never going to learn how to analyze or, or, or gather evidence as, other, as the technologies uh, that are used to commit crimes evolve. We're not saying that. So I don't want to, I, I don't want to identify those interests. But I, I think that what, what you see, uh, what you have to keep reminding ourselves is that the Fourth Amendment represents principles, principles. We believe uh, not, we believe in particularity, the particularity of searches and seizures under the Fourth Amendment, and we believe in reasonableness. That was great. Um, well, one thing that I want to talk about, I mean, this is, this I don't think it's discussed enough, which is the cost of inaction. Um, this is kind of the inverse of, of uh, Mike's urging to, for Congress to be proactive. In the context of uh, uh, letting courts decide these complicated issues, there's always the risk that they get them wrong. There's also years and years and years of delay of court cases. Um, ACLU obviously does a huge amount of work uh, fighting in the courts. They, they do amazing work there. Um, but it took us how long to get 215 uh, up to an appeals court? Um, I, I just think that's worth mentioning. The, and, and I'm going to invite anybody to comment on this. I, wanted to just reference some of the studies that have been done on the effects of surveillance um, because this is this is really interesting this is not an academic question Pew has found that 30 percent of all American adults have taken steps to hide their activity online uh, the Washington Post reported on a study that found broad self-censorship and it was particularly prevalent in groups that describe themselves as having nothing to hide and believing that one should be open to surveillance if they have nothing to hide uh, Pan American uh, in 2013 said one out of six writers have avoided writing on topics they thought would subject them to surveillance. And uh, I think one of the most interesting studies and one of the most interesting footprints that one could measure, uh, we've seen a 20% decline of views on the Wikipedia page for the, or for the Taliban. So the Wikipedia page for the Taliban has had a 20% decrease in views since the leaks about Snowden began. That's tens of millions of Americans, the vast majority of which are innocent, who have changed their activity because of what's going on. I just wanted to put a fine point on, on all of the excellent points that, that the panel has made. Um, and if anybody wants to comment, you're more than welcome to. Sure, the other thing, I'll, I'll be brief, because um, I don't know if we're doing questions. I'd, I'd love to answer any questions folks have. Um, uh, the other thing I'd add is that um, there's this re refrain, everyone's watched, everyone's watched, everyone's watched, which is true, uh, but everyone is not watched equally, 
And if you look at American history, certain groups are watched a heck of a lot more than others. Um, uh, political minorities, uh, uh, religious minorities on the right and the left, uh, and racial and ethnic minorities. And um, to continue the theme I was talking about earlier with Martin Luther King, if you name an African-American civil rights activist in the 20th and 21st centuries, uh, chances are extraordinarily strong that he or she was surveilled, uh, uh, often in the name of national security, not law enforcement, national security. So um, not just Martin Luther King, Fannie Lou Hammer, Marcus Garvey, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Whitney Young, Muhammad Ali, uh, all of these folks were, um, were surveilled uh, in the name of national security, and there was a cost to it. Uh, uh, there was a cost to it, as you can see from the suicide letter that was sent to Martin Luther King. And so it's not just people, you know, regular people like us, you know, uh, um, who are, ch are, you know, uh, changing our intellectual uh, um, exploration, which is a very serious thing, by the way. Um, but it is people that we all, I think, would admire that are changing their behavior also. Um, and um, so there is there's un undoubtedly a cost. I think if I could also leave you with one thought, it's, you know, when I've, a lot of times when I've talked to offices about various issues, they've said, well, let's just wait for the courts to figure it out. And I think if you're waiting for the courts to figure out a lot of privacy issues, then you're, you may be waiting in vain, and in the interim, there are going to be thousands, if not millions, of people who are affected by bad policies. Um, what we've seen is sort of two phenomenons. One is that the courts are not particularly good at keeping up with technological developments. And so when we think about things like location tracking or new technologies, you know, the cases that are being decided today are on technology that's five, six, seven, eight years old. You know, in some ways, even the reasoning and the basis for those decisions are now obsolete. Um, and they often don't reflect the way technology is being used and the effect. And the second thing is you layer that phenomenon onto secrecy. Anytime there has been new technology, whether, and I shouldn't say anytime, I'd say many cases where there's new technology, whether it's in the national security context or even domestically, what we've seen is a concerted effort in many cases by the government to hide the use of that technology, not just from the public, not just from your bosses, but often even from courts. You know, Stingrays is the example that I often give. You know, there were emails that we got as a result of an ACLU FOIA where the Department of Justice had instructed, you know, local DAs to say, if you get information from a stingray, refer to information from a confidential source so that the judge wouldn't be able to necessarily know or assess. There were cases in Washington State where there were judges who signed off on search warrants and said after the fact, I had no idea that what I was doing was signing off the, on the use of this, this device that actually affected you know, countless third parties. And so, you know, when you think about the secrecy, when you think about how courts, um, how slow courts move, I think that what all of that points to is the real need for Congress to, to lean forward and legislate in this area. Um, and I think you've seen, you know, the same ask even from justices in the Supreme Court who really invited Congress to weigh in and legislate in these areas. Um, two quick thoughts. One, uh, speaking of civil rights leaders, one of the members of the Fourth Amendment Caucus that I am just incredibly excited to know is, is participating, is Representative John Lewis. Um, his, uh, he has an FBI file. Uh, what more do you need to say? He's actually got a, a Facebook uh, uh, picture of, of him reading it um, that I was looking at the other day, um, which I just <laughs> feel like whoever signed off on that warrant has got to just kind of be like, oh, I just picked the wrong guy. Um, uh, also, and to, to hone in on a point that Nima was making, um, and this is, this is true, stingrays are, are like the colloquial name for cell site simulators. Um, that's also actually quite literally a model name and it's the old model. Um, that it is in, it, the hailstorm I think is what the, the newest one is. It's got more capabilities, it's better, stronger, faster, um, and more terrifying. And it'll be 10 years until we have a court case about it. Um, and then lastly, and I wanna start up a, a discussion about this. Um, Nemo's talking about the, the problems to notice, and, and Alvar also mentioned earlier the, uh, what's called the NGI system um, by the FBI, which is this giant database of biometric information that is um, uh, incredibly powerful at a minimum. One 
also wonky word that, that I like to throw around a lot is parallel construction, or term I should say. Um, parallel construction is there's a big version, a small version, that we can skip past that. Really what this is about is notice and the right of defendants to challenge evidence used against them. It's worth mentioning, and I, I'd, I'd like to hear Nemo and everybody's thoughts on, on this, but can you talk about how that component, that, that far end where a defendant is saying, how did you get this information about me, about why that's so important, and I'm going to tie this on the other side to why it's so important that Congress guarantees that that kind of uh, uh, response is possible. Yeah, I mean, yeah, thank you for bringing up notice. I mean, I think notice is, you know, so important for people to focus on for two reasons. One, the Constitution requires it, right? I think, uh, you know, the, the Fourth Amendment, you know, and built into that from court cases is this idea that if the government is going to use evidence against me in a court of law or a proceeding, that I have a right to know how they gather that evidence and I have the right to challenge it. Um, and what I think what we're seeing increasingly is you know, individuals in whether it's criminal court or potentially even other proceedings, you know, not being provided that notice with undermines their ability, I think, to, to wage, wage legal challenges. Separate from that, I think we should all be concerned about notice because notice is the avenue for judicial review. You know, when we talk about how important the courts are and we talk about the need for courts to weigh in on whether it's new technologies, whether it's applications of existing laws, if no one is ever notified, you know, it's very difficult for an individual to bring that case, whether it's a civil suit or whether it's a criminal case. It's sort of like, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, does it make a noise? That's kind of like notice, right? Without notice, you know, the tree fell, someone's rights were violated, and there's potentially no recourse and, um, and remedy. And so I think that, you know, when, if you're trying to think of the Fourth Amendment from sort of a structural standpoint and how do we build in the checks and balances to make sure um, that violations are, you know, we both know about them and we're able to, you know, give remedies. Um, it's really important to think about notice and standing and how we make sure that people are able to assert their rights vis-a-vis um, -vis the courts or even just, you know, in the court of public opinion to tell their member of Congress that something has happened to them and, and something needs to change. So, so then I'll, I'll tie this back into the, the proactiveness debate or, or conversation that we were having. The defendant is not in, uh, or, or the Constitution would suggest the defendant is in a, a uh, in ultimate form the opportunity to push back on surveillance. Um, an example that kind of underlies one of these points is actually back to Basali Moallen, who's that 215 case that I mentioned. The way that Basali Moallen, um, and I was a reporter at the time, I interviewed the the. Uh, defense lawyer who was representing him, um, the way that Basali Moalan learned that he was subject to 215 surveillance was because after uh, Edward Snowden began to leak, uh, FBI Deputy Director, I think his name was Sean Joyce, went before Congress and said, oh, we have a case that shows how this is useful, uh, the telephone metadata dragnet to be specific, um, and it's Basali Moalan. And that was months after he was convicted. That's a, a that's not the way it's supposed to work, um, to, to, put a, uh, to put a point on it. The oversight, and I, I want to invite everybody's uh, points here and then invite kind of conclusory statements and we can go to questions. So if you have a question, start raising your hand. We'll talk longer if nobody's raising your hand. Um, but Congress, even if your boss, let's say your staff member, even if your boss you know, uh, has the more surveillance, less surveillance framework and, and, and it's difficult to break out of, after that is the conversation about oversight. Even if there's surveillance, even if you, even if you disagree with some of the things that have been said, uh, please, for the love of God, we should know about it. We should know what the law is. Um, that's, my, that's my momentary thought, but uh, I invite the three of you to, to comment on this, and then, you know, in as much as you want to comment on anything else. And yeah, let's share this one. Um, so uh, one of the things that I think has been really, really helpful uh, uh, have, has been the proactive efforts on the part of uh, uh, companies, and particularly uh, uh, the Internet companies, to, to publish transparency reports to the extent that they can, or that they are allowed to under the law, uh, that they can publish uh, 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 collected, uh, aggregated information about what, how information that they collect in the course of their doing business is being used and what, how government is demanding it. Um, it's uh, in the course of the uh, uh, Snowden, after the Snowden revelations in 2013, 
uh, you know, Google took a lot of heat for not disclosing stuff that it was not allowed to legally disclose re regarding uh, uh, compliance with surveillance letters. Uh, and, and it's okay for Google to take the heat. I mean, it's a big company. But, uh, but the important thing to remember is that we actually have some, we can actually learn from what uh, uh, some of these companies that are strong enough to fight back are doing, and we ca Congress can learn. We could actually ask this of every company. We could ask for everybody to, be, uh, to, to publish transparency reports, or we could ask government agencies to publish transparency reports. We, we need to think about this, and I'll just give you an example that has not yet been mentioned. Think about Uber. Every one of you has ever used Uber or Lyft or any other ride-sharing service. You know, you see the little map uh, when you get your bill. <laughs> you know where you were. They know where you were, too. They've just reported it to you. Uh, they have a lot of geolocation. They have a lot of information about you that they're collecting that you volunteer to them. Um, so uh, uh, one of the things that I know from talking to folks at Uber is that uh, uh, gov governments at the state and local level, often in the uh, context of regulating taxi and livery services, uh, are actually seeking com disclosure of where the calls come from, where people go, uh, and, and they're turned over. They essentially have to be turned over willy-nilly under state law or under local law uh, uh, to government agencies, and they're never erased, and they're always there. Um, and the question, there are some fundamental questions about reasonableness there. There's some fundamental Fourth Amendment questions about whether my location should always be tracked. Oversight, I'm going to return to the, to the subject I touched upon at the start, uh, face recognition technology. So um, 2012, FBI comes to Congress, comes to the Senate, um, Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Privacy, which I used to work um, for the chairman of. Um, uh, and FBI is asking a lot of tough questions, FBI. Hey, how will this powerful technology, how, how can you assure us it won't be misused to identify protesters at a rally? And um, this wasn't a random question. There was actually an FBI slideshow showing how it could be used at people attending uh, a presidential rallies for the 2008 election. Um, and the FBI uh, official there said, don't worry, uh, we're going to have audits for misuse. We are going to audit everyone who uses this system, okay? 2015, there is a privacy impact assessment that Congress required uh, under the E-Government Act. And again, the FBI tells the whole American public, don't worry, there will be audits for misuse. There will be oversight, internal oversight of the system. 2016, last month, the GAO releases their audit of the FBI, which finds that the FBI has never, not once, conducted an audit of the states using the FBI database. This is the database that the FBI wants to further enshroud in secrecy. So um, internal oversight is not enough. There needs to be external oversight from Congress to these systems. Um, and then the last thing I'll say uh, as, as a, as a um, closing thought is, you know, imagine if um, probably most of the folks in this room have a driver's license. And by the way, if you live in Maryland, congratulations, you're part of that uh, FBI, one out of three drivers, face recognition databases has been served, searched thousands and thousands of times. And, and their negotiations expand that to two out of every three drivers. Um, and that's real, that's not for me, that's from the GAO report released last month. You know, imagine when you went and got your driver's license that they said, well, uh, um, thanks so much for taking the photo, uh, you passed your driver's test, you actually now need to go down to your police station and give them your fingerprints. If you didn't like your photograph before. <laughs> right, 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 right. You are so not gonna like it when the police right. do that for you. And, 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 and so you take that photograph, you pass that driving exam, and they say, you're all set, you just gotta, you just gotta give us a certificate from your, from your um, local police station uh, just confirming that you submitted your fingerprints. Um, you'd be up in arms, right? There is no precedent in, in American law, to my knowledge, American law enforcement history of using a database of totally innocent people who are guilty of wanting to drive uh, uh, and using it to, uh, for or biometric like, uh, scanning uh, technology. Wanting a driver's license. There you go, there you go. Wanting a driver's license. Or maybe license. a right, state-issued right. ID. They, right. They may not even be able to drive. Exactly, exactly. So um, I, think, I think this is just... Um, beyond the pale and requires uh, deep oversight and, uh, and ultimately legislation from you and from state legislatures. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanna talk about oversight too because I think that Sean hit the nail on the head. It is really important. Um, and it's particularly in the context of section 702 of FISA and 12333, which you know, it talks about. You know, at this stage, there is so little information that the public and members of Congress have about the way these surveillance authorities work. And I think there's, three basic pieces of information that members should demand and without this information say that they're not willing to reauthorize or continue programs. 
I think the first is, you know, when it comes to 702, when it comes to 12333, we still don't have an account of the number of Americans who have their information collected. Basic information. Um, members of Congress have asked for it. So this isn't something where, you know, you don't have Senator Wyden, Representative Lofgren, and, and Poe, and others who have asked for account of this account, at least in the 702 context. Um, and I think that what this really does is, you know, it's critical for Congress's ability to provide oversight of when, you know, the administration and the intelligence agencies say, hey, this isn't affecting um, Americans, it doesn't have an impact on, you know, um, constitutional rights of people in the U.S., their ability to really assess whether that's true. Um, the second thing which we still don't understand, and I think um, this is true in the 702-12-333 context, is also true in other contexts, is how the government interprets its notice obligations. You know, certainly with regards at least to 702, um, there's a statutory obligation on the government to provide notice in cases where they use this evidence in criminal cases. But the ACLU has litigation, you know, that demonstrates that in a variety of cases, they're not providing this notice. And civil liberties groups, not just the ACLU, but a multitude have asked the Department of Justice and said, you know, we understand that things may be law enforcement sentences, but tell us how you're interpreting your statutory obligation. Um, and we're still waiting for an answer to that question. Members of Congress have asked in hearings, and they're still waiting for an answer to that question. You know, basic information about how the government is complying with its statutory obligation, how they are determining when they provide notice to criminal defendants. And so that's something that, again, is something I'd urge your, your bosses to ask about. Um, and the third is, you know, something that, that Alvaro touched on in the, the facial recognition context is, you know, how many times are they searching through these databases for information, um, whether it's related to a national security or, you know, a general domestic criminal investigation? You know, we know that information that's collected for national security purposes can be used for prosecution of domestic crimes. And I think that we need a better understanding of how often are those databases being searched, um, particularly by the FBI. Um, whose policies permit them to be searched and permit them to be used outside the national security context. Because what that means is, you know, many justifications and, you know, broad collection that happens in the name of national security, you know, very much has implications for people's domestic rights um, and for um, domestic prosecution of crimes. Uh, I just wanted to toss it out. Does anybody have any questions? I'm going to give it three seconds. Okay. Uh, I should have saved the conclusive remarks for the other side, but um, uh, I'm sure that it'll be good to have a conversation. Uh, anybody is welcome to stay and talk with the panelists afterward. My, uh, my own closing remarks, um, thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you so much to the Fourth Amendment Caucus, the members, the staff members who made that happen. I can't wait to see what you do with it. It's an amazing opportunity, and I think there's a lot of, a lot of opportunities, a lot of potential there. Um, the, the last thought that I have goes back to the number of people who have changed their behavior because of surveillance. And to me, this is something that I, I, I hope that everybody who's in a position to make policy thinks about every time they have a chance. The number of people who change their activity because of mass surveillance is going to climb as long as those people believe that there aren't effective checks on what's going on, there aren't effective limits to what the government can do. And that number is going to increase and increase and increase until at some point it stops. And when it stops, it'll go back down, not because people aren't afraid of government surveillance, but because they never expected privacy in the first place. The positive note I want to end on is the point that Mike brought up in the beginning, <laughs> which is that the people in this room have incredible power. The Fourth Amendment is a floor that we need to stand up on. And you are the people who can do it, and I look forward to watching you do it. Thank you very much. Thank you again.